This is episode 69. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Hello, Architect Nation. I am your host, Enoch Sears. On this show, you're going to discover strategies, tips, and secrets for running a fun, flexible, and profitable architecture practice. So thanks for joining us today. It is great to have you here. Now, to get access to training webinars and other insider-only resources, go over to Business of Architecture and join our insiders list. You'll also want to sign up for the early notification list for the Business of Architecture conference. This is going to be the event this year for solo and small firm architects that want to run a more flexible and profitable firm and have fun doing it. We've got a great lineup of speakers, but only those on the list will get first notice with all the deets. So head on over to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash conference and get on the list. Today's show is underwritten with generous support from BQE Software, the developers of Archie Office. So I just want to thank them for their generous support of the show. For over 10 years, Archie Office has been helping architects run firms that are more flexible, fun, and profitable. So thank you, Archie Office, for empowering business of architecture, and we're glad for all you're doing out there to help architects run a more successful business. Check it out at archieoffice.com. Today's guest is Thomas R. Fisher. Thomas Fisher is a professor of architecture and the dean of the College of Design at the University of Minnesota. He leads the revolutionary design program there, and he also writes extensively on architecture and design. He's a frequent contributor to Architect Magazine. Tom Fisher, welcome back to the Business of Architecture. Happy to be here. Great. Well, you know, when we were talking before last week's show, you talked a little bit about the disruption that you're seeing. And I think that's just such a great word for what's happening both in architecture and in academia. Could you tell me a little bit about what you're seeing? Well, um, the digital revolution and the fact that we're moving into a new uh, industrial revolution is really having a disruptive effect on virtually every industry. I mean, we've seen what it's done to the music business and to journalism and um, I think we're going to see similar kinds of disruptions across every industry, including the construction industry and including higher education. And in fact, there's evidence of how that's already starting to happen. Uh, maybe to just step back, uh, the economist Jeremy Rifkin has been writing about the rise of a third industrial revolution in which we are moving out of a mass production, mass consumption economy of the 20th century into what he calls a mass customization economy of the 21st century. And um, I think what that's doing is it's uh, uh, sort of forcing uh, systems, be it the construction industry as a system or uh, higher ed as a system, uh, to be much more responsive to individual needs. Um, uh, and so, for example, in higher ed, we basically have had a mass production mentality toward education. You come in as a freshman, you leave as a senior, you go through a standard curriculum, and it's a little bit like an assembly line, which was the characteristic metaphor of the of the second industrial revolution that Henry Ford started about 100 years ago. Um, now students are coming in and saying, no, I don't want to just go through a standardized curriculum. I want to be able to combine architecture and sustainability and maybe some business courses and maybe a little bit of sociology, and I want to be able to sort of customize my education. And um, this runs up against sort of the accreditation processes which tend to standardize education. And in fact, it, that's misaligned with the needs. Um, increasingly, students want to c customize uh, what they're learning, and often because they have very specific goals in mind that they want to achieve. And so, so higher ed needs to think about how one do, does that and, and schools are starting to um, figure out ways to allow this kind of mass customization. And at the University of Minnesota, for example, um, we've taken our spring semester courses, divided the semester in half, so there's a whole series of short courses. So let's say a student wants to study architecture but have a strong business uh, focus, you can take a whole series of s short business courses um, that would give you a, a much stronger uh, basis to do work in that area when you um, graduate. And uh, and we're finding students really taking advantage of this ability to, in some ways, customize their education. Uh, now, architects uh, should be really good at this, right? Because we're always doing custom solutions to individual uh, clients' needs. And 
Um, and so, in one level, our uh, industry, and particularly the architectural profession, is is very well equipped to thrive in a mass customized economy such as the one we're in. However, the downside to the uh, profession's business model is that um, we have problems with the mass part. So we're good on the customization part. We're not so good on the mass customization part. Unlike other design fields, uh, you know, product design, for example, industrial design, they're really good at the, the mass part, and they're figuring out how to mass customize products. Um, and so I think uh, part of this is to, be, and we're beginning to explore new business models here at Minnesota. So, for example, uh, the architectural profession has what I've called a medical model of practice, which is that we serve the individual needs of, of fee-paying clients in the same way that a doctor does a individual analysis of a patient's illness, and um, you know the patient pays for that service through insurance and and all of that system that exists there, uh, and that's fine for those who can uh, pay our fees. I think the dilemma that the architectural profession faces is that we serve maybe two to three percent of the world's population. Um, and so I look at the other 95% of the world's population as an enormously um, uh, promising, untapped market for us. In other words, instead of saying, oh, well, there's no way we can serve most people on the planet, we should be saying, how can we serve everybody on the planet? And I've been interested in what medicine did. So medicine gave birth to public health to deal with the health needs of everyone on the planet. It didn't public health didn't replace medicine. We still have doctors doing customized solutions to patients, but public health has brought medical knowledge to everybody. And I think we're at the verge of giving birth to a public health version of architecture and design where in addition to doing the customized work for fee paying clients, we'll be doing mass customized projects uh, for potentially millions and millions of people. And so there's an enormous market there um, because our human population is growing rapidly. Uh, people are urbanizing at an unprecedented rate. For the first time in human history, now more than 50% of the human population lives in cities. And in the next a few decades, that's expected to go up to as high as 75%. So there's a lot of need for building um, but it's not going to be by people who can pay the traditional architectural fee. So then the question is, how do I organize a business in a way that allows my firm or me to respond to that need? Um, and so uh, we've been sort of working on what a public health version of the field would be and how firms would get uh, paid, who the clients would be. And I, I mention that because I believe that that's an entree into a mass customization way of thinking about architecture, that it is to develop prototypical solutions that can be adapted by local communities in very different climates and very different cultures to meet their needs. Um, and so it's customizable by local communities, but it's available to the masses. And Tom, you said that you are working on this as something that's happening at the University of Minnesota, research into this? Yeah, we've got, uh, we have funding from the university to um, establish, well, what we've been calling public uh, public interest design program, um, largely in our School of Architecture here, where we've been looking at um, how can we marry all of the work that we're doing here, like a lot of schools, in digital fabrication to the uh, needs of the human population around the globe. So how can we develop um, prototypical digital files that somebody could download on their cell phone in the middle of Africa, adapt, fabricate, and build for themselves um, based on the work that we're, we're doing here? So that, I think, is part of this third industrial revolution, which is that um, uh, the ability of um, consumers to also be producers uh, is, uh, is enormous. And the uh, information network that the Internet provides and that cell phone technology provides, 
where even in the most remote parts of this planet, you'll find people with cell phones mm -hmm. and, uh, and a cell phone connection. And so we now have the ability to distribute ideas, uh, designs to people all over the planet. Um, and so I think that uh, that's what we've begun to uh, think about here. And, um, you know, there's obviously a long way to go, and we'd love others to be working on this as well. But um, we believe this is part of the future of the profession. So, Tom, you've alluded to some of the details of the things you're discovering about how this public architecture system would work that serves the 95%. Could you give us some more specific examples of what you're discovering about this process? For instance, who, who pays for this and a little bit more about how this would work just conceptually? Well, we did this project uh, for the American Refugee Committee, which is an organization actually headquartered here in Minneapolis that does uh, work in refugee camps around the world. And when we first started working with them, we thought that you know the biggest need was housing and shelter. But it turns out, actually, they're pretty good in providing shelter. What what really is lacking in a lot of these informal settlements uh, is power, clean water, and sanitation. In other words, the infrastructure is what's needed. But these are settlements that governments either don't have the money to build infrastructure or don't want to because they don't want people to, to be there permanently. And so we began to look at portable infrastructure, basically infrastructure the size of a, of a, of a small building. And uh, so we did this design called the Clean Hub. Uh, an adjunct faculty member here, an architect in town named John Dwyer, led the effort. And it was basically putting inside a shipping container a uh, the roof unfolded as solar panels to generate power that then people could come and uh, plug in their cell phones, to recharge their cell phones, which was almost as important, maybe even more important than having an electric light, was to have a charged cell phone that it also gathered and and filtered water to clean the water. So there was a whole charcoal filtering system inside this container. And then there were also uh, composting toilets that pulled out, uh, uh, sort of rolled out of the shipping container that could be used by the, the local community uh, for sanitation. Uh, we finished the prototype at, right at the time when Katrina hit and uh, the Department of Homeland Security heard about our prototype and the day after the students completed it, they put it on a flatbed truck and took it down to New Orleans. And it was the first piece of working infrastructure in one of the uh, wards most heavily hit by Katrina. We've since done work. Uh, other I'm countries... sorry to interrupt, but how did that go? Yeah. It went fine. It's still down there. It's still operating. Wow. And it's now used, I think, basically for a park now that New Orleans has its uh, infrastructure back up. Uh, it's still functioning, uh, doing generating power and providing toilets and things like that. Um, we've since had conversations with other countries. Um, Indonesia has been interested in this uh, as a kind of a, of a network system. Uh, we've also discovered that there are cultural differences, so that in some cultures, women, for example, won't use public facilities. So you have to, we have to, you know, adjust these this um, design for for different climates and different cultures. But uh, it's an example where this was a group of architects and architecture students who basically designed something at the scale of a small building that actually becomes portable infrastructure uh, w widely needed across the globe. Um, so there's an example of um, uh, how one can sort of mass customize a design. The, and so the clients are World Health Organization, um, uh, Homeland Security, uh, NGOs like the American Refugee Committee or the American Red Cross. So your clients are different. Um, it could be also in the case of these infrastructure pieces, the uh, U.S. military, uh, where they're often going into disaster situations. Um, we've also done schemes where we provide um, pharmacies because one of the problems we discovered in some of these disasters is that if you put the medicines and tents, they get stolen. And so we showed how you could do, you know, in a shipping container, 
develop a secure pharmacy so that the uh, medicines don't get stolen, as well as providing facilities for the medical personnel who need to be in these communities but don't really want to sleep in the mud in a tent. And uh, so there's a whole set of other designs that have come out of this work um, that uh, the U.S. military has been uh, interested in. And so it's it's a different way of thinking about how to deploy our services. And it's strategic, it's creative, um, it's not necessarily the way in which um, uh, the military thinks about things. I mean, they, they sort of assume, well, everything just, you know, you drop things from helicopters and everyone's in a military tent. Well, mm-hmm. that doesn't always work or doesn't really meet the needs of people. So, Well, Tom, you know, people that maybe students who are, are potentially considering going to architecture school, I'd just like to give you the opportunity to talk a little bit about the University of Minnesota here and about what makes your program unique. Well, um, Minnesota's long had this strong humanitarian um, background. We have a lot of the major um, humanitarian organizations here, like the American Refugee Committee. We've got a lot of that work going on globally. So even though we're in the middle of the North American continent, um, we're pretty globally engaged, doing a lot of work in Africa and in India, um, down in places like Haiti. We had the first full-time design studio in Haiti after the earthquake. Um, We saw other schools of architecture come down, spend a few days, then leave and do designs back at their home campuses that were completely inappropriate for the community. Mm. So we felt the only way to really understand a community is actually set up a studio in the place and have the students living there with others and get a a sense of what is really doable. Um, So while other uh, schools were designing, you know, heavy timber buildings in a country where there is no timber um, or uh, expensive steel buildings when they can't, there is no steel, um, we were figuring out how to use concrete rubble of which there was all, it was everywhere. How do you make buildings out of concrete rubble? <clears throat> so, the, you know, when you actually put students in a place and they really listen to people and they see what the materials are, that's when you come up with the really creative solutions. So we've been, you know, that's really been a lot of our public interest design work. That's been led by two of my colleagues, uh, Jim Lutz and Varajita Singh. And um, so there's one aspect of Minnesota is this sense of global responsibility and participation. Another side to it has been this redesign of practice that I talked about in the previous session where we have this research practice consortium underway in partnership with firms. Uh, So we're one of the few land-grant universities in a big city. And um, so we do our best to get our students, you know, exposure to and working in firms, either as uh, employees and or as research assistants. And um, we're starting to have a real impact on changing the relationship between practice and the school. So that's a another area of strong uh, effort here. We also have <clears throat> a few research efforts underway that I think will also be transformative to the architectural profession. For example, we've uh, developed with Microsoft and NSF funding the largest <clears throat> virtual reality environment. Um, and uh, certainly in any university, it may be the, the only other big one is at Hollywood. But what we're doing is we're bringing in design teams to, um, with their clients to uh, have their clients walk through facilities. Um, you can walk through your sketch, have the client walk through your SketchUp model and make real-time changes. So a lot of the liability and litigation in architecture comes from clients expecting one thing and and being disappointed or even angry that it wasn't what they expected. And Mm -hmm. so what we're finding is that when you can have your clients walk through the building, you know, walk down the hall, look out the window, make sure that the widths are fine or that they can reach this cabinet or whatever it might be, and then you can make the changes real-time you get the, a kind of buy-in and understanding on the part of clients, which is transformative. So we've been working with several architectural firms and healthcare clients. We we, we did a big project where there was a, a hospital, a large emergency room suite that was being redesigned, and we brought the medical personnel in, and they put on the goggles 
walked through the emergency room, made changes real time, and in a matter of a few hours, basically went through a design session where they had worked through all of the issues that the people using the space had about it. And so it greatly accelerated um, that process. We also had a contractor come in in a building that was already started construction, and they they walked through with the goggles on and, and uh, identified about a million dollars worth of change orders that needed to happen. <laughs> um, and in a matter of about 15, 20 minutes, uh, saved what would have been about a million dollars worth of change uh, because there were some things that clearly weren't working once they were able to walk through it. Um, so the, the return on investment is enormous. So we're right now in the process of developing a portable model so that um, people don't have to come to uh, Minneapolis to do this, but that we'll be able to make this available to firms, to communities around the country, even to a job site. So you'll be able to, um, one of the other areas of interest is the, the contractors uh, who are having, you know, as we know, sometimes have a hard time reading our drawings, uh, to be able to walk them through the project so they can actually go up to a, a detail and actually look at how it went together. Um, uh, three-dimensionally, and they can look at it from different directions. We also have developed it so that you can be an avatar, so that you can be in a space with many other people, mm -hmm. uh, so you can have conversations while you're in the virtual space, as well as the ability to move things around, so that contractors can um, sort of practice doing tricky things before they actually have to do it live on the site. These are all things that we've been doing research on that we think is just about to hit uh, and will transform the way in which we communicate with clients, we engage clients, and we reduce uh, the cost and errors of construction. Tom, two last questions. And for for people who may want to collaborate with you or with the university, uh, please tell us how to get a hold of you. And then also for people who may be considering furthering their education at the University of Minnesota, where should they go to get uh, information? Well, uh, you can... Uh, come on to our uh, website, and it's College of Design, University of Minnesota, um, and it's uh, design.umn.edu. Um, you can also send me an email, and I can route you to the appropriate person. Uh, my email address is tfisher, T-F-I-S-H-E-R, no C in my last name, tfisher, and then the little at sign, umn.edu. Um, or you can also go on our website and contact people directly. Renee Chang um, and Lee Anderson are two of my colleagues in the School of Architecture who have been working on the virtual reality work, and they'd be happy to give you more information about that. Uh, Jim Lutz and Vraja Singh are doing the public interest design work, and all their emails are on our website. So people should feel free to contact them all directly. Well, thank you, Tom, for being on the show, and thank you for being on the cutting edge of redefining and redesigning the practice of architecture. I know I look forward to hearing more about your research and your pioneering work in this area. Well, um, thank you for the opportunity. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use Internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, do it anyway.